Allison, we are ready. It's All right. Your turn. Okay, great. Um, hello, everyone. Happy Saturday. Um, I'm so happy to be with you all, even remotely. Um, my name is Allison Lucan, and I uh, consider myself a data-driven storyteller. I'm currently with the Seattle Kraken of the NHL, where I do analytically driven writing for them and also on-air analysis during games. Um, but my job today is simply to facilitate conversation between four very brilliant and exciting uh, guests that we have. And with that in mind, our topic today is to talk about data science competitions in sports analytics. This can be such a great channel for people to either bolster their skills, meet other people within the sports analytics community, or get themselves noticed um, for future opportunities. And each of the people we have here has extensive experience in, in each of those avenues. And so with that, um, I could sit here and read to you a long, boring bio of each person, but I think what would be more exciting is for each of our panelists to share with you a little bit about themselves and their background specifically when it comes to data science uh, competitions. And Brendan, let's start with you. Uh, for sure. Thanks, Allison. So my name is Brendan Kumagai. I'm currently a master's student at Simon Fraser University, where I'm working on statistics and sports. And I'm also an intern with Zealous Analytics as a data scientist, where I work on the hockey team there, or the hockey research development team. Uh, so in the past, I've had a bit of success with some competition. So Mike's NFL Big Data Bowl, uh, I, happened, or I was part of the winning team last year. And the year before in the Staff Week's Big Data Cup, which is a hockey competition, um, I was part of the winning team for that. And uh, also at UConn here a couple of years ago, back when it was online, I won the poster competition. We'll just have you pass that mic right over to Mike. Yes. <laughs> All right, so uh, my name is Mike Lopez. I work at the National Football League. And uh, for a long time in sports, uh, data competitions were hackathons that were overnight and required you to travel and stay in a hotel and not sleep a lot. And uh, when I was at the league office, we thought about that model, um, but for us, it, it made more sense, especially with the complexity of some of our current tracking data, specifically the next-gen stats, made more sense to give folks more time. So we started a competition called the Big Data Bowl, um, which I, I will um, you know, hopefully not sound arrogant and say that it, it is one of the easiest ways into sports if you can do a good job with Big Data Bowl data. Um, there is there is the potential to get hired, and it's not just in football; it's really in all sports. Um, we share our player tracking data. This year, we will be entering, I think, our fifth big data bowl, uh, which will hopefully launch as of late September. Um, that's a joke because we're a couple weeks behind. Um, but the the idea is we share it in the fall, and then submissions are due in the winter. And it is, um, if, if you're interested in data science competitions and sports, um, it's a, a decent way into the field. Um, it also gives you a, a sort of a sense of what teams are dealing with now, which is a lot of times when you're answering these questions, uh, you're in the same spot as some analyst on a team. Um, and, and Tegan mentioned earlier the, the sort of complexity of, of what's going on in front offices and how the public data doesn't always reflect that. Um, at least in the big data bowl, you are seeing the complexity that front offices are facing. And someone who recently won the big data bowl, Asma, tell us about yourself. Hi everyone, I'm Asma Timi. I'm currently the Director of Analytics and Research at Pursue Care, a mental health company. And yes, I had the opportunity to participate in the 2021 Big Data Bowl. First time learning about football, first time wrangling that kind of data. Thank you, Mike, for making it essentially a three month competition because you definitely needed all that time. Um, yeah, I've been involved in that competition. I've also been involved as a judge for the Big Data Cup, which is hockey focused. So, yeah, thank you. Far too humble. Asma is a landmark in this field. <laughs> Meg, introduce yourselves to everyone. Sure. Hey, everybody. I'm Meg Rizdahl. Um, I am a product manager at Kaggle, which is a competitive data science platform. It's where you can go to actually compete in uh, competitions like the Big Data Bowl. Um, I've worked at Kaggle on almost all of our products for the last five or six years or so. Um, I mostly work on uh, data sets and notebooks, but I have a very, very special space in my heart for competitions. So I've, I've dabbled in competitions as well, designed several of my own. Um, I've also spent some time as a product manager at Stack Overflow, where I worked on public Q&A. 
Um, so kind of my whole shtick is online technical communities that care about open knowledge sharing. Um, and then, yeah, before industry, I worked, uh, no, I didn't work. I, uh, I got master's degrees in linguistics at NC State and UCLA um, and uh, have a little bit of experience working as a data scientist myself as well. Um, and yeah, that's a bit about me. Awesome. Well, we want this to be a conversation, so I may pose a question to one of you first, but anyone, please do jump in if the topic interests you. And Mike, you mentioned this already, um, but I wanted to hear from each of you as well. We'll start with you, Mike. Talk about uh, career advancement and how data competitions really can be a part of finding the next step in your career, be it in analytics or sports analytics. If you follow Mike on Twitter, you'll see every time someone in sports analytics wins a championship, he's sure to celebrate them. So I, th I think a lot of companies that are uh, nascent in their data organizations, when they go to hire data scientists or developers, uh, the, the folks that are doing the hiring, and again, Tegan mentioned this, so hopefully I'm not sounding too repetitive, they don't necessarily have the awareness of what they're looking for. Uh, and so in that sense, it can be hard when you get a stack of 300 resumes to sift through and identify the person that is the best candidate for your team. Um, and having a you know, uh, having something on your resume that speaks to the, your ability to answer and ask questions in sports can be a big leg up. And I think that is one of the, the main primary reasons that folks do this competition is so that they can say, hey, when, you know, you have a medium sized data set, because, you know, even the NFL tracking data, I wouldn't really call big data. But when you have a, a complex data set that, that you know, teams are, are trying to, to sift through, you know, I'm the type of person that can come and answer some of those questions. And so, you know, I think for us, it's always important to share the, you know, most up-to-date novel types of questions that teams are asking, you know, because people have had NFL play-by-play -play data for, you know, a couple decades at this point. Um, you can probably improve a win probability model or make an expected points model, and that will help. Um, but to be able to go through and, and answer questions with some of the, the most complex data, I think, is really, you know, where, where folks are trying to find an edge. Meg, from your experience, what have you seen in terms of people using these kind of competitions in, in various fields to, to take the next step professionally? Um, yeah, I mean, that's a huge component of what brings people to Kaggle competitions. I think what we provide is you know, a really unique opportunity for people to get access to data and the kinds of problems that you know, companies or research organizations or different, you know, different institutions are actually facing, you know, it has this real world applicability element that, you know, is so different from just like the kinds of like toy problems you might otherwise, um, you know, create or, you know, work on. And so, yeah, it provides a real kind of like learn by doing experience. So people are able to acquire new skills. People can also connect with other people who have, you know, an interest in this field who may, you know, have skills and ideas to share so you can learn from others. And then, of course, it's a way to actually showcase your work. So, you know, even if you're not winning a competition, it provides a way to share ideas, uh, you know, share your creativity. Um, and yeah, it ultimately I've seen, you know, success story after success story of people who have had, you know, uh, career advancement opportunities uh, through Kaggle competitions. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really rewarding part of my job to see that play out. And that feeds to something I definitely wanted to hear, Asma, from you first. You already alluded to this. Yeah, you've known the data science space so well for quite some time, but you learned football as part of your competition. And talk about the opportunity to build on additional skills and also working within a team. Maybe people help people understand how you can build a team and use a team to really provide the best product. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I want to say as a self-taught data scientist, these opportunities have been absolutely instrumental in two ways. One, sharpening my technical and statistical know-how. Uh, but also learning how to work in collaboration with others, whether that's in a team or in a presentation setting. And those, those facets have been really, really helpful in helping me advance in my career. In fact, it's oftentimes been the topic at interviews in which I was expected to delve into these projects and they were not very interested in the other <laughs> um, topics. So I think for career advancement, uh, it's been really, really helpful. Um, yeah. And Brendan, you too, you've worked on teams. Maybe share a little bit of 
how you develop a team, who do you find, who you can work with, and how do you find those working relationships that Asma just mentioned to make them really at the height of productivity so that you can get to the final prize? Yeah, uh, yeah. So with that, like in terms of kind of creating the team or picking a team, uh, I just reached out to people. So uh, for the Big Data Cup, I just knew a friend from Twitter pretty much, and we teamed up, and then he knew a couple other friends. So we just kind of ended up making this quasi random group of hockey Twitter people. Uh, then we just kind of work towards it every day. Um, like all of us put in a lot of effort into, you know, building it up day by day, just incrementally trying to improve our models. And we were all on the same page in that we really wanted to try to build out, like we had this big picture for what we wanted to do for our project. And it was a bit ambitious, but um, I, I guess part of what made us good there was that everyone was kind of putting all the effort they could into that, both in that and the big data bowl, which I'll kind of talk about a bit in a second too. Um, but yeah, I think it's important to all be on the same page in that like whether or be in, in the, when you're in the competition, just um, all be on the same page and what your goal is or what your goal is for the outcome. Like, do you want to go in there and try to win the competition, which might be a bit more work. Like it's gonna, you're gonna have to, make some sacrifices like, you know, you might have to sacrifice, say, not doing quite as well on a midterm as you would like, or not really spending as much time with friends as you would like during that time period. Um, but also on the other hand, you could just do the competition just to go in and build a project that's still very good, um, but you don't have to put in that extra commitment where you're kind of working overtime and trying to make the perfect visual or something like that. Um, so yeah, I guess that's one thing in terms of team building that you should be aware of when you're doing these competitions is just, you know, all kind of be on the same page or else you'll have kind of people pulling in different directions. And on top of that too, just having a diverse range of skill sets on your team is really awesome. Like, um, say during our big data bowl competition, um, I, I think I worked really well with our team because we all had kind of our own thing that we can specialize on, like say, uh, my teammate Riker, he was a big football guy. I knew not very much about football. So he was able to kind of guide us along in the parts that I was doing or a couple of other teammates to help us kind of figure that part out. And then on top of that, just having someone like my other teammate on the Big Data Bowl, Robin, who's a PhD, she had some good statistical and algorithmic ideas to add to the project where I was a bit better on the coding side. So we kind of helped bounce back and forth there and help build out our project. Awesome. I, you mentioned, Brendan, the importance of having a diverse set of skills. And uh, Mike, we'll start with you. And I want to hear from everyone on this. As a participant, what kind of resources should you be sure to have both within the members of your team and then also technical resources? What should you have in place to deliver a product for your submission? So, I mean, I think that the technical resource question, I almost don't even worry about because our job now is to share the data and I kind of have the easy job. Once it's out there, it's out there. Um, but I, I do think one of the things that is the reality is there's a lot of ways you can get help. Um, one of the, the resources on Kaggle that we like the most is the sort of discussion and forum section where you can ask questions and there will just be people that answer them that you don't know. Um, and the other thing that's really neat that I'll, I'll call out is a couple of groups have historically um, asked for help from outside sort of subject matter experts. Um, Asma has one really fun example where she um, asked for help from a former NFL coach. Uh, and then last year, um, I believe the uh, one of the groups of students from Pittsburgh asked the punter on the University of Pittsburgh football team for some help on where punters aim. There's a lot of people out there that, you know, have a passion for the sport that are probably going to be willing to help you. Um, you know, just sort of one overview phone call, like what could you look at? What would be good ideas? And I think those are, are generally underutilized. Um, one of the things I think we'll do in this year's Big Data Bowl competition is we're really gonna push participants to find a coach or a former player to work with uh, on a submission, um, not necessarily because we expect the, the coach or the former player to learn or know how to code, but they'll have a lot of sort of context for why players might've been doing something. And, and that context is, is always the trickiest part of, the, of these submissions is, you know, what are the things that, you know, are responsible for the, the dots moving in the directions that they're moving? Meg, you know these resources inside and out. You've already heard about some of them. What, what do you look for in terms of the elements you need, both human and technical, to, to get to a point in a project? 
Um, yeah, Mike actually already touched on a lot of really great, great elements. So I can add maybe a couple of things. Um, I mean, well, first, I do want to emphasize the kind of point about like a diversity of skill sets, perspectives, experience, um, you know, that adds a lot to a team, you know, in machine learning, there's this concept of ensembling and, you know, that's the way to win a competition. You know, the same goes for uh, the participants who are working together as a team, you know, you can ensemble those per perspectives and experiences and end up with a better result um, pretty consistently, I would say. Um, some other things that I've heard from uh, participants is honestly just somebody who can manage like basic project management. It's kind of like an overlooked maybe aspect of, uh, you know, team success, but, you know, just somebody who can keep a team organized. And, you know, I hear teams wanting to, you know, when they form kind of negotiate things like, you know, we've got people who are in Europe and in North America. How do we handle communication, async? How do we track, you know, the uh, results of the experiments that we're working on uh, independently um, and uh, kind of, yeah, just somebody who adds that project management layer. Uh, maybe this is my product manager bias speaking, um, but I do think that it adds a lot to just like the organization of a team. And then also, you know, it's more likely that others are going to be, want to work with you in the future if you are, you know, somebody who's reliable, consistent, and just a good, good team player, um, so to speak. Um, and then, yeah, I, I think like the Kaggle community and just the ML community at large is incredibly helpful. Um, you know, we really care about people, you know, being open and sharing and we think it's sort of a thing that, you know, it's the, the rising tide that lifts all boats, it's this open sharing element. And so, yeah, asking questions, not being afraid to, you know, say you don't know how to do something, um, you know, I think is maybe more important than just what are the technical tools, because those are always changing. All right, Asma, we have to hear the story. Tell us. <laughs> yeah, it the pandemic or the height of the pandemic, I should say, was was an interesting time. <laughs> I uh, I think it was really important for our team to make sure that our idea is something that can be understood by a coach slash player slash people who actually play the sport <laughs> for a living. And communication, I know, is a big criteria for winning the competition. And so I basically just uh, found him on Twitter and sent him a message and he was receptive to that. I don't know if I would be as successful doing it today, but it certainly worked in 2021. Um, and I want to stress that, you know, I'm, I, I didn't know this person. There was no kind of connection there. It's, it's really, you can be anyone and, and perhaps get access to these people. Um, so I think that was really important for us. We had multiple questions, multiple avenues that we wanted to take this project to, and it really helped us whittle it down to the one we were gonna go with. And I think Meg is right on the money on sort of needing a project manager in a team, because with these open-ended questions, it's really hard uh, to, you know, set yourself in a direction and keep up with with the project and make sure you're finished with it on time. And it helps also keep things fun while not rushing to write your submission or not rushing to to do the coding parts. Um, so yeah, that was that was really fun. And um, you know, looking back on it, uh, we had a lot of technical considerations uh, that you know we addressed but looking back maybe we would do things differently I think you know when you're working remotely with a team uh, it's important to have tools in place that make sure that you're working efficiently and that everyone has visibility as to what you're doing especially since you know there's certain project aspects that are dependent on others so I think github was a huge one for us um, Looking back, I think we would have put maybe the data behind a database to be able to query it more rapidly. Uh, we would also maybe create a package that helps streamline the data wrangling aspects of it so we're not duplicating every single time we want to look at the data. But yeah, lots of lots of lessons learned that I will for sure apply this coming competition. And Brendan, I want to make sure you have an opportunity to add anything, but I also wanted to ask you, you have worked with so many different teams. Are there instances, and certainly we're not looking to be negative, but are there instances where you've had to work through a team issue 
And how have you gotten through that? What resources did you use to make sure the team stayed productive, even if there were maybe communication hitches or, or something like that? Yeah, yeah, I think with that, um, in terms of issues that have come up in the past, um, uh, I guess when an issue does come up, so someone maybe doesn't code something right or it's not really working and you have a quick deadline coming up, it's sort of all hands on deck, like in our big datable project, say Robin and I worked on one side, then our other two teammates, Riker and Eli, worked on sort of the other part of the project. Um, so if they were having an issue, then we would help out and we would help them kind of work through it and try to figure out where the issue lies and just all work together as a team and come together, have a meeting and figure that out. So then they can keep moving on what they're doing and we'll get back to work on what we're doing and it, it'll make it everything a bit more efficient. And then the same thing, vice versa, if we're having an issue too. Um, yeah, in terms of just building a good submission and everything, uh, I pretty much like to parrot everything that Mike, Meg, and Asma just said. Uh, but on top of that as well, I think excitement is a big thing for me in, in terms of building a good submission, both like within your team, but also you're trying to excite the judges a bit to get a, a good grade on, on their assessment of you, right? So you, you want to have a submission that can kind of excite both sides of judges where you have people who might be more, be more sport oriented, like coaches. Um, on the other hand, you'll have people that are just straight up data scientists that like the sport, but they're more interested in the methods that you're doing. Um, so being able to have a submission that kind of walks that line where you can both say from a coach's perspective, like this can help you win more games or this, this can help you do your job better. And on the other hand, have something cool where you're doing some cool, unique statistical method or something new that people don't usually see. I think that's big. Um, and then on top of that as well, I'm, I'm a big fan of making good like visuals or trying to make things visually exciting. Uh, and yeah, like I, I guess I owe a huge shout out to the people that made, make the Tidyverse package and or all the Tidyverse packages with our studio, like ggplot and gganimate were really helpful there in doing that. Um, but yeah, I think that's, that's key to just having, having a way to kind of present it, present your ideas visually intuitively really helps communicate those difficult kind of more advanced statistical models or methods that you're using to an audience that might not know that quite as well. And Meg, you know, Osmo talked about lessons learned. And so again, this is something I want to hear from each of you because you come at data competitions from different perspectives. But lessons learned as maybe someone who's organizing a data competition, and you mentioned always growing the community, what kind of feedback do you strive to provide? What kind of feedback should an entrant expect to receive, whether they win or not in a data competition? Oh, that's a that's a really great, great question. Um, so the feedback that I've seen in the context of Kaggle competitions would really come largely from the community itself if you're sharing your approach. So when a competition ends, you know, some of the top competitors, but even just anybody who wants to share, you know, their their submission will often do what's called like a, we call them winners write-ups, but it doesn't have to be the winner. Um, and people will share them in the discussion forums, the ones that Mike mentioned, um, and they'll just kind of like outline their approach. They'll share some of their code. They'll share ideas about, you know, this is what worked, this is what didn't. Um, and that ends up being like, really great fodder for discussion and feedback about like like um you know kind of like post competition close it's like a little bit of like a debrief or post-mortem or you know so to speak um and uh so that's like where I, I see a lot of like the open feedback that's shared um there may also be feedback shared um in you know in, be in between winners and the hosts themselves but um yeah i can't speak to that super specifically um, but, uh, yeah, those winner write-ups end up being incredibly valuable resources because then when we launch a new competition that's around maybe a similar problem, people will go back to those past competitions for inspiration. So, um, you know, I, I don't know, you know, we've, we've run, you know, the big data bowl year to year people, if there's anything, you know, any knowledge or insights that's, you know, translated, you know, over the course of years, people will go back and reference that, um, and apply it where relevant. Um, so yeah, I think kind of got at your question, but uh, yeah, that's, that's, those are my thoughts. 
Mike, what do you see from, you know, I've seen different approaches to from when judges review submissions and then there's feedback provided. What are, do you have perspectives on what kind of feedback a participant can expect to receive? So we, we, we have a couple of rounds of judging. Uh, the, the first round of judging is done by team analytics staffers. So we, we send it to data scientists and uh, other analysts on teams and ask them to review all the submissions. Uh, you know, we work with Kaggle on what the, the best criterion for scoring is. Ultimately, it, it comes down to what the team analysts are looking for. And, um, you know, their, their perspective is a, a mix of both subject specific expertise on the football side and, and also a, a good amount of data savvy. Um, we, we try to balance it. Every paper gets read by at least two judges just so that there's, there's enough uh, sort of balance. Um, we actually use statistical modeling to account for judger bias. Um, but, but typically what they're looking for is folks that have the data awareness but also have the, the football context. Um, you know, that, that's a thin line to walk in terms of having and, and, and being able to, to submit something that, that covers all those bases. Um, but ultimately that, that's kind of where they're looking for. Um, you know, Brendan's right that there's a lot of focus on their end about communication of results, whether that's a visualization um, or, or something else that you can do in your submission that sort of says, here's, here's what I did, here's what I'm trying to do, and here's what shows it. Um, you know, from a, 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 a real world perspective, the accuracy of a model, you know, when you're a GM or a head coach, if you can improve accuracy by 1%, that, that, that might not necessarily mean something to them. Um, but if you can get them to act on whatever you're trying to do in the first place, that's a much, much bigger uh, sort of a factor of a submission. And the submissions that, that do that aren't necessarily the ones that improve accuracy by 1%, but they're the, they're the ones that get people to make different decisions based on their work. Um, and so that's ultimately what you're trying to do. And one of the other aspects that I'll just call out, especially because we're gonna launch soon, is you know, a submission doesn't have to be all encompassing. You don't have to try and solve football uh, with a submission. You don't have to try and solve hockey or they did a horse racing one, right? You have to move the literature forward just a little bit. And if that means taking a simplified approach and instead of looking, you know, sort of at everything about a position or about a play, you know, look at one specific position or look at one specific position on a certain play type, um, that can be a little bit easier in the sense that you're not trying to solve the whole sport. You're just trying to solve for one specific uh, question. And I think the submissions that, that tend to do well, you know, try and reduce all those com that, that complexity of the tracking data down to sort of those simple components. Brendan, I'll ask you, because you made the great point of decide what your intent is when you enter a data competition. So if we're talking about maybe a group or an individual who maybe feels they're at more of an introductory level of their skills and they're coming at this to learn, do you have an example of, of feedback you've received or how feedback or going through this process can help someone kind of advance down the path of knowledge and skill? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think um, while going through the process, we got a lot of feedback in both of the competitions we did just from people that we knew sort of in the industry. So say um, on our big data bowl, uh, I'm at Simon Fraser University and we're lucky enough to have some former champions that won the big data bowl a few years before that. So Allison, I know you know Danny pretty well. Then also um, Matt Ryers and Lucas Wu, who were part of the, I think the 2019 or the inaugural championship. Uh, so when we were preparing for our presentation in, in the big data bowl final, they gave it a look over, gave us some great feedback on that. Um, so I know obviously not everyone's just gonna have people like that. That's right there like a stone's throw away to um, give them feedback on it. But generally people online are very helpful in the sports analytics community, I find. Um, so yeah, like even if you do your submission and you just want someone to take a look over, um, it might be worth it to just reach out to some people that are already established in the industry. Uh, they might not always be able to help you because I'm pretty sure a good chunk of the judges for the Big Data Bowl and Big Data Cup are all industry people. So they, they, I don't think they'd be able to give you a review before you submit. But uh, yeah, I think that would be worth it just to you know reach out to some people and talk to people online and interact to people. That's sort of how I got, um, got started in the industry and started rolling the ball down the hill by talking to people that uh, I met online really. So. Yeah, I think that's that's an important thing to do. Asma, I know you've been both, a, you've submitted entrants, but then you've also judged other competitions. You've also run mentorship programs through Hockey Graphs. 
what is your perspective on that feedback loop that participants might receive and, and how that can help someone who's maybe just starting out in this field or looking to improve their skill set? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Brendan brought up something that is oftentimes successful is, is reaching out to, to people with your idea and getting their feedback. Um, I say, given just how busy some people can be, um, and I, I think that it's helpful to maybe reach out to them, but also be as detailed as possible, not really asking them to review your whole project idea, but maybe certain aspects that you're wondering about. I think that will increase the likelihood of getting an actual response back. I think something else that can be done is sharing snippets of your analysis on Kaggle because it accommodates that. And there's a pretty healthy comment section. I know we got a lot of feedback through that when our submission was done. <laughs> um, some good, some bad, you know, it's it's a democratic process. Um, so that that could also be a way to garner some, some feedback as well. And of course, Twitter, Twitter users, especially sports users are very active um, on there and happy to share opinions. Um, in terms of me being on the other side of, of judging, I think, Mike, I'll just echo what he said. Uh, it's not always about having the most technically complex project, one that has the most accuracy. It's really about communication. You'll lose the judges if they're not understanding what you're trying to do, what you're trying to solve for. And being able to communicate how your project will help in their decision making or help in their evaluation, depending on the project, goes a super, super long way. So those are my two cents <laughs> on back and judging. Well, and that leads us right to, you know, of course, we have the SMT data competition with our poster finalists uh, coming later today. But let's flip the switch here. We've talked a lot about the participant experience, but we have people on this panel who have put on data competitions as well. And maybe someone's watching or listening who's like, hmm, I might be wanting to do this. It's super easy, right, Mike? Can you walk us through how to design a successful data science competition? Well, uh... <laughs> we got lucky. I mean, if I, knowing what I know about the league now, if I tried to share tracking data now and sort of launch a data science competition, I'm not, I'm not totally sure we would have the traction to do it. Um, when I started at the league, it was kind of an idea. It was like, hey, let's, let's, let's try and get some of our data public. Um, but there's, you know, companies play millions of dollars for access to NFL next gen stats. Um, and here I am putting it on a GitHub page in my third month at the NFL league office. Um, so that, that's, that's kind of the trick is sort of a combination of the data complexity and, and the novelty of that data, because ultimately people want to analyze newer data sets that they haven't seen before. Um, and also, you know, having questions that can actually help the league, you know, for us, it's always been really important to collaborate with, uh, both our next gen stats team, AWS, who has been our, our principal sponsor for the last couple of seasons, uh, on what questions that we could ask that would also benefit them. Um, because ultimately we're, we're a league office. I would love to learn about, you know, how to, uh, you know, use tracking data to predict an offensive holding penalty or, or things that would like really help our team. But most people out in the public don't necessarily care about that. Um, and also our next gen stats team probably wouldn't care about that either. So it's kind of a collaborative process of what are the questions that we could encourage participants to solve for um, that would ultimately help us. And, you know, I think one of our, our favorite competitions was 2020 where uh, we did a rushing prediction model and, you know, that, that single uh, model that was submitted that won that competition, I think has now produced four metrics that you can go on the NFL's next gen site and look at. And, you know, that, if that competition costs the league about $100,000, um, you know, all, all in terms of sponsorship and, and, and whatever. And in terms of ROI, if you're getting four metrics that are on the site and used on air, you know, that, I don't know if we'll ever replicate that because that was, you know, sort of a, a big win in terms of, you know, working with our partners to have a, a story that a lot of people can buy into. Meg, what have you learned about putting on data competitions through the years? Yeah, happy to answer that question. Um, yeah, our team obviously thinks very, very deeply about what does a successful data science competition look like. Um, and, you know, one of the biggest things that we care about or that we kind of optimize for, so to speak, is just providing 
really great experiences for our community that they're going to find, you know, as, you know, helpful opportunities to learn new skills, connect with others in the community, advance their careers. That's typically what, you know, kind of characterizes people's motivation for participating in competitions. And so we try to, you know, align, you know, around that objective. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, I think, you know, there's a few things that are really important. And first is um, having a really clear problem and to solve that, you know, relates to some business objective. Um, people are less interested in participating in competitions where there's maybe some like abstract problem or it's just sort of like, um, oh, you can, you could theoretically do machine learning on this problem, but you know, the why isn't very clear. People really care actually quite a lot about what is that why? Um, and they want to know that this is going to have like a positive you know, outcome for the, you know, the host, whoever that may be, may be. Um, and so really designing around like a very clear business objective. Um, and then, you know, of course, there's a lot that goes into uh, design of the data set itself. Um, quite a lot, um, you know, it could theoretically almost be infinite amount of work that you put into preparing a data set um, and doing things like checking for leakage, um, making sure that you have appropriate test uh, train and evaluation sets. Um, you know, in particular, the private leaderboard at Kaggle has been super powerful for, for do, uh, preventing things like overfitting, um, selecting, you know, an appropriate evaluation metric, um, getting all of these things right is really important to making sure that the competition feels fair, um, that it feels, you know, it's high quality, and then, you know, it's ultimately really important to the success. Um, and then finally, you know, the last thing we really care about is just creating like an exciting sense of community. I think Brendan mentioned one of the things that he's interested in in you know working with a team is just like that sense of excitement um and so uh you know uh you know the prize is of course like a big part of that and sometimes we try to you know in include you know even prizes not just for winning but you know doing things like sharing publicly uh, your code or ideas as the the competition goes on so just kind of like other elements of like excitement around a competition uh, like that so yeah all right, Brendan, now is your chance. Are there things that you've seen in data competitions that you really loved and wish you saw more of, or things that maybe fell short, no names mentioned? <laughs> uh, in, in terms of like other or submissions or even my own? No, or? It just from, from the organizer perspective, what's really made a successful oh, experience okay. for you? Yeah, yeah, I mean, the, I guess I could give a quick shout out to Mike here and that the big data ball data was the cleanest data set I've worked with. It was so nice and smooth and all the tracking data seemed perfect. We didn't really find an error in anything, at least as, as far as we looked in our data cleaning process. Um, so yeah, that was super awesome to work with. Um, same with the staff leads data too. Like it, was, it wasn't quite at the same level of granularity. We were just looking at play-by-play -play data. So like you have a, a shot and a pass and recoveries and where they're coming from on the ice, but you don't have every player's location. That was still... Super easy to work with. Like the the data was very logical and how things broke down. There there was some weird things that would happen, but it was just weird things in hockey. Like uh, there's things you'll see stuff in the data that you think, oh wow, that that actually happens in a game. Like uh, there'll be a shot at one end, and then you'll see a shot at the other end two seconds later, and it'll be because someone took a shot, it missed the net, rimmed around the boards, went down to the other side of the ice, and someone on the other team just took a shot immediately right as they get to the puck. So um, yeah, I guess that's that's not really <laughs> not really anything negative on staff leads part. That's just weird stuff that happens in hockey and I think in most sports. But yeah, especially with the little puck bouncing around everywhere, that's um, it's going to be a bit of a pain to really do model hockey stuff in hockey quite as well as some other sports. But um, yeah, yeah, I don't really have too much ne like anything negative to say because both have been super awesome and they've been great learning experiences for me and have been great for uh, both like professional development and just advancing my career forward in, in terms of job opportunities. Asma, anything you've seen that really makes a data competition even a, a superior experience as opposed to just a great experience? Yeah, definitely. As, as someone who engages with sports for fun and not so much for, you know, professional development or landing a a, a job in sports it's it's really the community aspect it's, it's like the 2021 version of the big data bowl was 
was just incredible. A lot of us were terminally online, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, so we tweeted a lot. We tweeted tips on how to approach the data. She would have been online anyways. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, all the packages that have been developed um, as a result and just, yeah, just all the exchange that, that happened is was really made it fun for me. And, and I know that's a consideration for the organizers and they've all done a fantastic job in, in fostering that. We have just a few minutes left before we open it up to questions um, from our attendees, but I wanted to just last call, we've heard so many great points about what really makes a submission stand out or what really makes a winning submission. Does anyone have any points that maybe they think we haven't really touched on that people can take away when they start to put their submission together? I'll, I'll circle back on, on one thing, which is there, there is some luck involved in the competition. You know, we, we send out papers, but we can't send out every paper to every judge. So there's some, you know, just, just luck based there. Um, there's also a little bit of luck in terms of, you know, if you're trying to maximize or solve or or a metric that that things can can you know help you or or, or not help you. One of the very first Kaggle uh, sports competitions was a March machine learning competition back in 2014. Um, the the winners the two winners are in this room. Uh, I was one of them, and the other one uh, is is uh, Greg Matthews, who's sitting over there. And there were a couple of ways that we got really lucky. One was uh, one of the two of us. I I won't say who it was, but it, it wasn't me. Uh, coded Ohio State as Ohio. Um, and in that year, in 2014, that meant that we gave Ohio's team strength was Ohio State. Ohio State was a much better team. Ohio was the 13 seed and actually happened to win their first game. So we got really lucky because Greg made a typo. Um, I'm sorry, one of the <laughs> two of us made a typo. And and we ended up winning that competition, and, and that was you're, you're based on accuracy, like based on your log loss, and so lowest log loss wins. But a couple of things happened. We actually didn't originally win the competition. Somebody won, but then was removed for cheating. And so we were actually in second place, um, but got bumped up because the first place person had you know submitted multiple entries. So we got lucky in that way. And then what we did is we we simulated the entire tournament to figure out how lucky we got, which was. Like if we assume that we were right and all of our probabilities for the competition were the truth, how often would our submission, which was the truth, actually win? And I, I think we won about 10% of the time. And so even when we knew we were right and we had the ground truth probabilities, we were still about nine times more likely than not to lose our own the competition with our, our truth you know, probability. So that, that kind of gave us a good perspective is that when you go into this, um, you know, there's some luck on, in terms of how you code, there's some luck in terms of uh, who your judges are. And, and even when you're, you're solving for something that, that has a, a sort of a ground truth solution, you're, you're being assessed based on your accuracy. There's also inherent luck there. Um, and I think that, that, you know, for participants, you know, the, the process is, is the reward there. And, you know, we, we offer pretty big prizes in the big data bowl. Um, which we do because I, I want to be able to reward people for outstanding work. Um, but a lot of the, the reasons that you want to enter these competitions is the, the process itself and the learning, the community, um, building your skill set, you know, putting your side inside the, uh, yourself inside the front offices of teams to try and answer the questions that they're trying to solve for too. Anyone else have thoughts on what makes a winning submission? I mean, I love the idea that a winning submission is one in which, you know, you've learned something uh, through the process of developing that submission. Um, and I think that this is, you know, somewhat similar to, to Mike's thoughts, but I think, you know, submitting to a competition can be a very humbling experience. I have heard a lot of times competitors are joining their very first Kaggle competition and they go in blazing hot with confidence and they're like, this is, this seems easy. I'm going to be at the top of the leaderboard. I'm going to, you know, win a prize. And then the private leaderboard is revealed, which is evaluated on a subset of the, the test set. And, uh, they find out that they've overfit dramatically. They've dropped hundreds of places in the leaderboard and then they're like, oh my God. Um, and, uh, you know, my advice is, you know, that happens to the best, you know, machine learners in the world you know, I've seen that happen, you know, countless times and. Uh, take away from it, you know, what did you, you know, there's that, that in itself as a learning experience, 
Um, you'll learn how to overfit, you know, to, you know, avoid overfitting next time. Just take away what you can learn from it and, um, you know, embrace it as a humbling experience and build on that for your next, next uh, submission. Um, so, yeah. Awesome. Any final thoughts, Asma or Brendan? Yeah, I'd say, like Mike was saying, luck is definitely part of it. Like part of our submission, when we coded it out, we were just kind of scrambling to get the code together and it was a little bit messy. Then I went back about a month ago when we were preparing for another presentation on the same subject uh, and I recoded it and I made it kind of nice and fancy in the code a lot cleaner, but it took about triple the time to run. And overall running it on all the data would have taken like 18 hours for like, so that that's just something that I, I guess there's little things along the way, like, like Mike was saying, you know, and a typo could, could end up leading to good luck. And, and in the big data bowl, there's 268 submissions. And I saw at least 40 really great ones that I was worried like, oh yeah, are these guys going to beat us? So that's something to be aware of too. Um, but yeah, I, I think even not, even if you don't win, I think it's it's more about the friends you make along the way. Like uh, one of one of my teammates um, on the Big Data Cup, Tyrell Stokes. He's a, a good friend of mine now. I didn't even know him before the competition. Um, he taught me. He's probably taught me more than any other individual about data science and sports analytics and yeah, anything related to this this field. Um, and now he's my direct coworker at Zealous and. He's teaching me even more stuff every day. So yeah, he helped me get the job there too. So even if we didn't win the competition, I would consider that a massive win for my career. So yeah. All right, before we turn it over to questions, Asma, you get the final word. Yes, just some small final thoughts. Uh, I, I think as important as it is to have a project manager on the team, we should also have a hater on the team. Someone that like anticipates all, you know, all the inefficiencies, everything that could go wrong with your project, things that are in the back of judges' minds. Um, so I think having a healthy amount of criticism on your project, and especially as you're writing it, is helpful. I think also letting the judges and everyone who's reading your submission kind of take a peek inside your model, especially if it's a machine learning one. There's a lot of great work on explainability. And that's something also that translates, you know, when you work professionally, you know, even the non-technical stakeholders are going to have some questions about how your project came to be. So I think that helps also having maybe a social media strategy around your project. I know we were very, we thought about that a lot. We made sure to share as much as we can before the competition, um, when the submission was launched. We hyped it up, uh, so we got lots of good feedback, and I think that already made us winners in my book. You know, I mean, obviously it was nice getting fifteen thousand dollars, but uh, <laughs> you know, all you know, all the all the social media interactions with our project really made it worth it, um, and it helped also, I think, in the credibility of of our work, and that can bias things. I don't know, I think it did for us. <laughs> <laughs> well, Asma, Meg. Mike and Brendan, I appreciate so much your insights through this formal part of the panel. We want to have a few minutes here for any questions from the audience for any member of the panel here today. I'll turn it over to those of you in person. Uh, I'll go first. Um, so you mentioned uh, Amazon Web Service and uh, the next gen stats that you have in the NFL. Um, is there like an AI that interprets what's happening on the field and then, you know, transmits that into a data set? Or are there actually some human beings that are watching the game and inputting certain variables manually? And if so, how do you account for that error? Because I'm sure, you know, like the, the NHL, a lot of things in a computer and AI couldn't actually, you know, translate that into actual data. So how do you account for some of the human element of um, creating some of those variables if that does exist in the NFL? So I think I can't speak to hockey, but at least on the football side, you know, the, the way the player tracking data comes in, um, there are sort of two ways that events can be tagged. Uh, one is automated using the, the tracking data itself. Um, so for example, you know, the ball is, is placed down by the uh, field judge or side judge and it's sort of sitting there. That 
that says like, okay, the ball's in play, but it's not ready to be snapped. Um, then everybody gets out, the line gets set, and then the ball is snapped. Well, that, that ball is, is snapped, that movement of the ball suggests that, okay, the, this is the time that we register the ball snap. So whenever you start, you know, when we pick the, the start of a play to, to happen in the NFL, you know, that's what we would choose. Um, there are other things that happen within a play that there are spotters at the field that would tag manually. Um, you know, I, I think the league works pretty hard to try to make sure that the definitions are universal, um, ubiquitous throughout, because the, the people that are doing it are scoring it by watching it and trying to tag when within the game that that happened. Um, you know, for example, this year, you know, we're tracking quarterback slides. So when a quarterback is on the run and then decides to slide in the open field, we don't have an algorithm to do that. We're relying on somebody to identify, all right, that's a quarterback and that person slid. You know, is there, are there differences? Probably somebody might start the quarterback slide tag at the, you know, when the player decides to, to start the slide, uh, somebody else might do it at the end, you know, but we try to work with them to sort of say like, okay, well, we're going to mark it when the knee hits the ground or something like that. So, uh, those are definite, I, I wouldn't call them issues, but there are things that, that could get in the way of, of getting all you can from the tracking data. Um, but it, it's a mix of, of both sort of, you know, uh, automated tasks, but then also event taggers. Um, hi, um, oh, okay. It's working. Uh, I'm not sure if this is a question, although I'd love, uh, to hear what the panelists have to say. Uh, Allison mentioned that we're hosting the SMT data challenge here. This is the first time that, uh, it's been done at all. And it's actually a pretty big deal because it's a student competition where students are working with real world baseball player tracking data. Uh, to my knowledge, and maybe the panel can speak to this, I don't think player tracking data has been available in a public competition before. And we've gotten some great, great, um, well, I mean, a lot of entries, but the work for the finalists, and we have a graduate and an undergraduate division, um, three posters each, but please go out and see them. People have done some amazing work, and uh, so much of what you said in this panel really, you know, it sounds like we did it right, because a lot of the things, I mean, we, we had um, much more than just, like, the idea of fitting a model uh, this was truly data science. Um, it was a bit open-ended. So, you know, it was just make sure there's player movement involved. But uh, we had uh, not just people with technical backgrounds. We had players. We had active and retired major league players. As judges, we had an umpire. We had a scout. Um, you know, we had people from front offices. We had people in academia. Uh, and... Part of the important thing with the posters and with the papers that we were given was that things had to be accessible and understandable to people in industry. You know, it wasn't just going to be enough to say, okay, my algorithm worked. You actually, you know, there had to be a point to it and the fact that it was ultimately something that would be used and would be interesting. So I'm really excited. Um, I don't know how many people here are baseball people, but it's the first time we've done this, and I really hope everybody comes out and takes a look because we've had people come in quite literally from all over the world to do this. Not kidding. We had someone come from overseas. So anyway, uh, I'd be curious about the player tracking stuff, but otherwise, yeah. Uh, so my question is, when you guys make new rules in the league, how much of data influences the decision to implement a new rule? Uh, I, is that, I might be the only person on, in a league office, so I think that might be for me. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, I, there's, for generally for almost NFL league rules, we try to help. You know, support from a, a perspective of what are you trying to, to solve for? And in other words, you know, you're, when you evaluate an overtime rule, for example, are you trying to maximize excitement? Are you trying to minimize injuries? Are you trying to 
uh, make it the simplest explanation for fans. Um, because whatever format you might come up with, and that's just a toy example, but it also the most recent one, you might come up with a different solution. And depending on what you're, you know, what part of that conversation you're trying to su support, data might play a pretty, pretty big role. Um, equity was the role last year that we played a lot with in terms of what are the most competitive equitable formats uh, for an overtime format. You know, the only really way to answer that is with data. Um, you can have conjectures about what you think a format might do for equity, um, but but. But that would be one that would, you know, where data would play a big role. But there might be other parts of the conversation where, um, you know, data would be less important. But I think with each growing year, you know, at least at the NFL side, you know, data plays a, a larger role uh, in terms of understanding and supplementing those conversations. Um, so when you guys talk about, like, reaching out to coaches for the big data bowl and stuff like that, um, what's the best way to, like, reach out with them and just keep consistent contact throughout the project? So, I mean, I think this is a road that's probably less paved than maybe it should be. Um, we, you know, when we often hear from teams there when they're looking for analysts, you know, some are looking for, you know, folks with the data science skills. Others are looking for quite literally coaches that also know a little bit about, you know, statistics. And so that's really who we're targeting, um, how and, and what the conversation looks like to get in touch with those people. Uh, we're a little less clear on, you know, but I think this year we're going to push folks to reach out to coaches. Um, you know, if in America, there's a high school football team. Is there an assistant coach that is interested in data in every town? Probably not. Um, but there's, you know, several hundred colleges where there's an offensive line coach or a, um, a secondary coach or somebody who might know about expected points and win probability. Um, and, you know, you might strike out three or four times, um, but if you find a coach who says like, hey, yeah, I'll, I'll help you out, you know, here's a, here's your analysis and, you know, why did the defensive end do this or why did the running back there? You know, those are the types of things that I think really help. So, um, you know, what those questions look like and how successful all of them will be, we're certainly not sure, um, but it's something we're going to continue to push for. Asma, before the next question, I'm curious, when you reached out to the NFL resource you did, were there continued communications to that end or was it more transactional with your questions? Yeah, so looking back on how we approached it, I, I think it we had to make it such that it was an easy it, it was easy for him to say yes. So with that being said, we're like, we would just love. 15 to 30 minutes of your time on Zoom. We'll send you a link. We just want to discuss blah, blah, blah about defensive effectiveness. Um, so that was helpful because uh, I think most people, you know, would be willing to just sit around for 30 minutes and and, and talk about uh, things in a low stakes way. Not so much you kind of sending them, you know, a written analysis and for them to look it over. Uh, so that was helpful. And yeah, we ended up following each other on Twitter and and talked about a few things here, here and there. Uh, but it really did start with just, you know, an approach in which, you know, it's low stakes, informal, kind of office hour style. Like we're just here to kind of uh, ask you some questions, general questions. So, yeah. <laughs> For those of you who have participated it in these competitions, uh, what's one thing that you wish you spent more time on and what's one thing you wish you spent less time on? It's a good question. Uh, <laughs> I think in terms of stuff that, like I, I feel like there's sometimes where I get a bit stuck in the weeds on stuff where I try to fixate a little bit too much on like how the code looks or how like how like kind of reproducible the process is, which is very valuable. Um, there's sometimes where I spend a bit too much time making that a bit too perfect. Uh, at least for me, like I, I do most of the coding type of stuff when I'm on these projects. So um, not that I do most of the, coding, but like that's that's the main thing that I I focus my time on. Um, so yeah, I guess just a little too much just focusing on perfecting things or being too much of a perfectionist. Uh, I feel like that that can kind of come a bit later in the process when you're trying to, you know, make the perfect like submission or presentation. But yeah, just making sure that everything is correct is the main thing. Um, once you have that, you can kind of move on 
then revisit that if you're at a point where just have kind of well commented files, but don't really overstress the coding, at least for me. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess that would be my answer there. Sorry if that's, I don't know too much other than the, the coding stuff there. Yeah, I think for us, looking back on it, we spent a lot of time on feature engineering. Uh, I think we spent a lot of time on it because it was mostly our first time approaching this data and, you know, in sort of making an effort to code everything up yourself, it helps you deepen your understanding of the data and the dynamics that you find in there. Uh, but looking back on it, I think now the big data bowl is a few years old. A lot of code is out there. Uh, so if you can find any sorts of efficiencies in readapting someone's code to generate those features themselves, I think that would be the way to go because it certainly took us a long time <laughs> to get those features up up and going. Yeah, that, that's actually a good point for this year's competition too. And um, speaking back to some of the stuff Mega said too about how you know we can use previous Kaggle forums and discussions to really drive this year's competition. And so, you know, it seems like a new year and it'll be a totally different theme, but in essence a lot of the themes and 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 metrics that are features you can create will be similar to years past. All right. I want to be sure to keep us on time. I don't know how many more questions are in the room, but uh do we want to keep going or shall we move on to lunch in our poster session. I'll defer to those in the room. Allison? Yes. Allison, can you see any questions online? There are no additional questions online for this. Oh, excuse me. Uh, there is one that just came in. We'll end with this one then, I think. Uh, right. this, this is from Tim. Um, for Asma and Brendan, how did you deal with the unproductive days while doing the project? Just grind it out at the end. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> the big data ball that was really 90% of our work was done in the last two or three weeks. So we basically just sacrificed our Christmas holiday to get a good submission in. Um, that's really like, I, I guess that's kind of my, my, my experience, not really my advice there. Um, so yeah, like during the semester, we were pretty busy with coursework and stuff um, where we really just met once a week and kind of brainstormed and did a little bit of coding here and there when we had a few spare hours. Uh, but yeah, once classes ended, we just kind of got down to work. We all went home and just worked remotely. And, you know, I think the last few days I stayed up until 3 a.m. just making sure that the code was good. But yeah, yeah, that's that's kind of my experience there. Yeah, I think on, on that, you know, it really is dependent on people's schedules and, you know, I'm privileged enough to have a nine to five where after five, I can, you know, dedicate myself to this. Uh, we wanted to make sure not to push this to the last minute. Once again, going back to the social media strategy, we pushed our submission a whole two days before. We kind of got to savor that a little bit and people checked us out and, and um, helped, you know, get credibility for our project. Uh, but with that being said, unproductive days, th those are gonna happen, uh, but I think it's important to stick as much as possible to regular check-ins. I'm pretty sure we met, you know, at least once a week and there wasn't, you know, a ton of pressure associated with each check-in. It wasn't like someone was supposed to come in and having had their quote unquote homework done. Uh, we could just check in on things that were half baked um, and just talk about that, you know, as a group. And that was really helpful. It's it's not always helpful to just show when something's done. It's also helpful to show it while things are underway. Uh, so, yeah, I think regular check ins, you know, when holidays happen, you know, it's okay to to not be as productive as possible. But I think going back to the project management side, I think what helps things be fun and productive is really someone that has an eye for deadlines and making sure that things are being done um, as time goes on. Awesome. Well, I can't think of a better Sorry, way. Sorry, Allison. Oh, please. I have one more question. Okay. Um, 
When can we expect an announcement on the theme of this year's Big Data Bowl? <laughs> this year's theme will be offensive and defensive lineman evaluation on pass plays. Uh, we'll be sharing data from last year, drop back passes. And uh, yeah, like I said earlier, you can expect that competition to drop in late September. <laughs> Thank there, you. There you go. Very important. All right. On that note, <laughs> um, you heard about our exciting uh, SMT data competition and the posters that are available to you. We strongly encourage those of you who are there to check those out during this lunch break. Um, and we will be coming back for our training workshops at 1.45. Again, Mike, Brendan, Asma, Meg, can't thank you enough. Virtual applause and hopefully applause there in the room for everyone. And thank you for sharing your knowledge, your wisdom, and your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Allison, Megan, Asma, Brendan, and Mike. <laughs>